Am I am I on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. How are you guys doing tonight? Okay, how many of you came from work? Oh yeah, you're my heroes. You are my heroes. You are truly dedicated to the word and, and I love that. Um, for those of you that maybe if this is your first time doing insights or your first semester stepping in, um, my name is Phyllis Bond and my husband Dave and I have been married for 30 years now and we have been attending Kensington uh, really pretty much from the beginning. We have just gone north with every campus. So right now we are as far north as I want to go in Lake Orion, but you know what? If God says go, we'll go. But. I'm telling them that we're not right now. So right now we are at the Lake Orion campus. We have three kids. We live in Rochester Hills. Um, I have a 25 year old son, Trevor, a 23 year old daughter, Lydia, um, and an almost 17 year old daughter, Hallie. So we still have one more at home with us for a little bit. Um, and my favorite thing, my sweet spot at Kensington is being in the word and being in the word with women. So. This is out of all the things that Dave and I have been a part of in our time at Kensington, this really is my very favorite thing to do. So it really, believe me when I tell you, it really is an honor for me to be here tonight with you guys. Um, this is some pretty heavy stuff. I mean, this chapter 18, there's some, you know, he's got, he's serious business in chapter 18. Um, so. We're going to walk through it, um, but I want to tell you, I, I'm going to be really honest with you. This was the hardest teach I've ever prepped for um, out of all my years of teaching. And to be quite honest with you, at this point, we usually show you a picture of our family. Um, and sometimes people have shown you pictures of them studying and, you know, how they have their words spread out with a cup of coffee and a beautiful sunshine beaming in through the door. So I'm going to show you, this is what it looked like for me preparing for this teach. <laughs> and I am not exaggerating. That is what it looked like. I spent a lot of time on the ground in tears. Didn't necessarily have the wine bottle with me, but spent a lot of time in tears over this. Um, so this is gonna look a little different than a lot of the teaches that I have done before. Um, you know, it's heavy stuff, but I believe there's more than what meets the eye in there. So that's why your handout looks a little blank, because I'll tell you quite honestly, when I stepped back and I looked at this text, what I really saw was this higher calling that Jesus was calling us to, and that is the calling of humility. What I really saw in this text is that it starts with humility and it ends with love, and there's a whole lot of uncomfortable in between. So your blank page is for the uncomfortable. <laughs> so you feel free, we'll, we'll go over a lot of notes, but I, um, I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna spend more than half of our time together today, really just like a really big small group, talking through humility, and really what God opened up for me in terms of understanding what that looks like and how it really radically changed the way that I view this text. You see, in this chapter, Jesus is really schooling the disciples, isn't it? Isn't he? Like this is, and, and, and keep in mind, this is his own little posse that's asking the questions this time, right? Jesus is telling the disciples and us in this text how to be in relationships with other believers. This is really all about relationships within the church. And it's some hard truth that we really have to grapple with if we want to live a life that is truly kingdom led. And it seems to me as we look at this, these disciples are a little uncomfortable with what Jesus is calling them to. I think they want clarity in what this looks like. And it doesn't feel comfortable for them. It's kind of like what Michelle said a couple weeks ago when she taught. They wanted an equation for success. They wanted to know, if I do this and this and this, will I get the result that I want? Because that's so much more comfortable. It goes right back to this upside down kingdom that we talked about in the beginning, right? Even when he, the Sermon on the Mount, when he gives us these beatitudes, they're all kind of backwards for our thinking, but that's the way his kingdom works. And that's, that's the disciples are looking for an order and they're looking for it to feel comfortable and something attainable and something that they can achieve. But that's just not where it's going. 
So really what I had to ask myself is, am I willing to seek the answers and to be obedient to him based on what I hear? Because I believe he's calling us to a very deep and very difficult place in this chapter of humility. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? To do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. You see, after a lot of tears and a lot of really hard talks with Jesus over this text, here is what I know is true. Humility grounds the soul and it opens the heart to love and peace. And, and it sounds backwards. Humility grounds the soul, and it opens the heart to love and peace. In his words today, in this chapter, he is calling us to dig in the really hard places of sin, judgment, forgiveness. And he's pretty direct about it, right? Like, he's, he's not beating around the bush. He's pretty strong with it. But before we can really step into those issues, I really believe we have to take a step back and we need to look at what precedes it in order to really absorb ourselves into it. And it reminded me back years ago when my middle daughter was preschool, three, maybe four. And she and her best friend, Hannah, used to play all the time. And I can remember this happening on several occasions, but one time in particular, I'm up in the kitchen and I hear Lydia. Now, Lydia's just a tiny little thing, always has been. She's even smaller than me as an adult. So as a little one, she was just so cute and little. But man, you know, that did not reflect what was going on inside. Because I would hear her come up the basement stairs. And one time in particular, I remember hearing her come up and it was a... You know, she wasn't sulking, she wasn't sad, she was stomping. She walked in the kitchen and she said, put your little hand on her hip, Hannah told me I'm bossy. <laughs> and I said, really? So here's the little parenting tip, if any of you have littles at home. This was the best line I ever had in my toolbox. I said, Lydia, what happened right before Hannah told you you were bossy? And she said, I told Hannah, we are going to play school. I am the teacher. She is the student. And she is to sit there and take her test. And when she is done with her test, I will grade her test. And she cannot get up until she is done. And I thought, you're bossy. <laughs> I said, honey, OK, let's talk about that. But here's what it, it made me realize. I needed to know what happened right before that. Like, why did Hannah tell her she was bossy? Now, by the way, we just had our whole family over on Sunday. And Lydia's 23 now. She's married. She's a teacher. And I said, do you mind if I share that story? She goes, no, I don't care. She is my introverted thinker, right? She goes, I don't care. About five minutes later, she goes, just so you know, <laughs> Hannah loved it. <laughs> Hannah liked it when I told her what to do. I'm like. <laughs> I am sure she did. <laughs> and then I said to Anthony, good luck, son-in-law. <laughs> I didn't, because really, she is incredibly precious. She is dynamic. I love that young woman. Um, but it was really funny, just so you know, Hannah. And Hannah was just recently in her wedding. Like, they're great friends. But all that to say, looking back at what happened right before really does help us to see why this present thing happened. And it helps us to move ahead. Because in this text, he calls us to a humility that will guide all of those interactions. It's like humility is the backdrop for our relationships. It's the foundation, and it's the backdrop of who Jesus is. And yet what I realized is that I really don't understand what humility is. I thought I did. I thought I did. So I began to read and really ask Jesus and really unpack that one. And I began to look at Jesus as the ultimate picture of humility. So here's the definition of humility in Webster's Dictionary. It's a modest or low view of one's importance, humbleness. Now look at C.S. Lewis, what he says of humility. Because I could read that and I could say, OK, I can get my head around that one. Then I read this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. 
If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell them the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. Now that comment sent me spinning. Because suddenly I had to look at myself as someone that had pride, that I was prideful. So I started digging, I started reading, I started researching, and I ended up picking up the, one of the books I purchased that I really enjoyed was called Humble Roots by Hannah Anderson. Great book. And as I'm reading it, she starts, starts out by defining what humility is not, which I thought it was kind of interesting. She speaks of a false humility, um, kind of what we hear it referred to quite often times as a humble brag, maybe. So I'm going to read to you some of these, okay? Here's the first one. So grateful to be trusted with shepherding this church. Translation. I hold a position of importance, and people listen to me. I'm so humbled to see my artwork bless so many people. Translation, look how many people read my books, come to my concerts, and listen to my lectures. What did I do to get such a great, hardworking, attractive, thoughtful man? For some reason, he loves me and treats me like a queen. Translation, a wonderful man loves me, so I must be wonderful too. My kid made the honor roll at XYZ Middle School. Translation, my kid is really smart. What can yours do? And perhaps the most famous humble brag of all, God, I thank you that I am not like her. <laughs> Translation, I am better than other people. So here's the deal. I totally laughed when I read those. And I'll be honest with you, I could think of a bunch of different people that said those things. So I was thinking about everybody else that is prideful that has said those things. And then it hit me. Those things really aren't so funny because in some ways I've said them myself too. Like I could see myself in it the more I dug into it. We've all let pride corrupt our attempts at humility. Now, of course, it manifests itself differently in, in each one of us. Some of us debase ourselves or will use self-deprecating language as a way to invite reassurance or praise, right? Or after a personal success, we may deflect praise or congratulations, which simply forces those around us to repeat them again, right? Or here's a really good one. This is where I could really see myself. Sometimes we even wallow in our unworthiness as a means of signaling our spiritual superiority. Because unlike other people, we're aware of our helplessness, right? It's, it's like, I know it kind of hurts the brain to think about it, but this is where it forced me to dig really deep and see where I fall in that. Now, let me tell you, I, I did not enjoy this process. I don't enjoy this right now. I mean, I love being here. I love going through the word. I don't like the discomfort that's in it. I don't like the fact that this is challenging and it is hard and it is painful and it is uncomfortable and it hurts. But I also know that without that discomfort, I don't ever get to that sweet place with Jesus. It's a constant stripping, isn't it? Like I keep waiting to arrive. And just when I feel like I've arrived, I've reached pride. And he shows me that I haven't arrived and a teach like this comes along. Jesus wants to get at the root of the problem so that humility becomes natural to us. You see, we tend to think of pride as something we conquer, right? And as humility, we think of humility as something that we can attain. We know that we're supposed to model Jesus' own humility. We know that God opposes the proud, so we commit ourselves to intentionally practicing humility to intentionally be humble. But here's what I found. Humility is not a commodity. It is not something that we achieve. It is not something we earn. It is not something we accomplish. So what is humility? And if I want to reflect the character of the God in whose, uh, whose image I was created, then how do I become a more humble person? How do I obtain and attain humility. You see, when we look at the life of Jesus, I can find a million different descriptions of what humility is, right? 
It's who he was. And it really formed every interaction that he had. Every interaction he had, the backdrop and the DNA of it was from a place of humility. And while I will never be just like Jesus this side of heaven, I have to, I am called to sit back and learn and watch and desire to be more and more like him. His words in Matthew chapter 11 earlier in our homework really struck me. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So after I read that, I thought, okay, I'm going to search scripture and find every interaction that, that reveals Jesus' humility. Do you know how many verses I had to sift through? It was like half of the New Testament and a lot of the Old Testament. So here's some of the verses, and I kind of just wanted, I thought it would be good for us to walk through them together. So while they're not on your handout, you can take a picture of them if you want. You can write it down. These are great verses to go back and look at and sit in. The first one is 2 Corinthians 8, 9. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Hebrews 5, 7. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Sometimes we don't want to cry in front of people or we don't want to break down. Why? Because we don't want people to see that part of us. But here, our Jesus broke down and offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears. Luke twenty-two twenty-seven. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. Jesus says, for I am among you as the one who serves. He is the one who serves. John 13, 5. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. This one really hit me. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. It's like that phrase just kept sticking in my head. He did not open his mouth. I thought, how many times I've opened my mouth because I felt like I had a right to. He forsake all of his rights. And then finally, Philippians 2.8. He humbled himself in obedience to God. And he died a criminal's death on the cross. You see, I look at all these verses because it helps me to understand the kind of man that Jesus is and was. And most of the time, a majority of the time, it shows me how far I am from that, from that and from him. And then I went back to that verse in chapter 11 and I saw it in a different light. It was like the aha moment. He says, come to me and you will find rest for your souls. I think in the message version, it says, walk with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light, and you will find rest for your souls. I thought, yeah, the only reason he can do that is because because he comes from a place of humility. And he's inviting us to walk alongside him, to learn from him, and to find rest from him. You see, here's what hit me when I read that. It's all about the surrender. Because putting my head in that yoke, in that wooden yoke, coming alongside of him, that's a surrender moment. That's a moment where I say, I can't do this. And I need you. I can't do it on my own. 
Because without the power of the Holy Spirit, without surrendering to Him, following the guidelines that He gave us in this chapter of sin and forgiveness and reconciliation, it would make me crazy. I would never be able to do it, and it would be maddening. I was one of these kids um, when I was about six or seven that um, my mom decided that I would be a very proper girl. And so she put me in charm school. And as well as literally charm school, can, can you not tell? <laughs> can you tell? Not only did she enroll me in charm school, but she put me in piano lessons because it was important to learn how to play piano and know which fork to use and how to go through a buffet line. All of those things were very important. So I start the piano lessons, and I hated it. Like, they got a new piano. I hated practicing. I complained. I complained. The piano teacher came by every week the same day, and I just muddled through until finally I got to about 10 years old, and I decided I was going to be really verbal about my dislike of this. And I made sure she knew how much I hated practicing. And sometimes I just wouldn't practice. So when the teacher would come, then she would say to my mom, she really needs to be practicing or she's not going to get any better. So finally one day my mom said to me, if you don't practice, I'm pulling piano lessons from you. And I thought, OK, bam. So I didn't practice. The piano teacher was set to come that week, and she didn't show up. And I said to my mom, what's happening? And she said, I told you, you complain one more time, and I pull them. And she pulled them. Fast forward to my late 40s. I'm now in my 50s. I decide I want to start taking piano again. Oh, yeah, my mom thinks that is hilarious now, because now I'm paying for it, right? So I'm taking piano lessons again. Do you know how hard it is to learn piano in your late 40s? I'm kicking myself for quitting when I was younger, and I'm kicking myself every time I write the check out. And so, of course, my husband went and bought me a piano, and I'm taking my piano lessons, and I'm diligent about my, about my practicing now. But when I go in and I meet with my piano teacher, she's an incredible, accomplished pianist. And when she sits down and plays, I just stare at her sometimes. Like, I look at her hands moving, and I look at her eyes tracking with the notes, and not even looking down at the keyboard. And she's playing, and she knows where her hands are going, and she's amazing. And I think to myself, I want to play like Catherine. I want to be as good as Catherine. And then it hit me the other day. I will never be as good as Catherine. You know why? I am not Catherine. And the only way I will ever be able to play like Catherine is if she did a quantum leap into my body, <laughs> took over my body, her hands became my hands, her eyes became my eyes, her ear became my ear, then I would be able to kick it out just like her. And it struck me, that is how it is with the Holy Spirit, right? Like, when the Holy Spirit lives in us, we have power to do things we cannot do on our own. And apart from him, you know, we're chopsticking it, right? <laughs> but the minute we get that Holy Spirit in us, he gives us power to do things that we did not think we can do. I came across this quote by Dietrich von Hildebrand. <clears throat> He says, it is only in our, in our encounter with a personal God that we become fully aware of our condition as creatures and fling from us the last particle of self-glory. You see, here's the challenge. When I really get with Jesus, when I really settle into the Holy Spirit that lives in me, I get a much clearer picture of who I am. And I get a much clearer picture of who he is, right? So then I'm forced to ask myself the question, do I set aside the time that it takes to be in his presence? Like, do I do that? Am I intentional about that? Do I place a high enough value on an encounter with Jesus that I'm willing to sacrifice things that I really enjoy? Not bad things. Things like sleep. Like, am I willing to get up an hour early? Or my favorite TV show, right? Or a book. Or, come on, I know you guys take your phone with you into the potty, right? And you start flipping through social media, right? Isn't that the first thing we start to flip through? No, like even if you're not on the potty, even if you're just sitting with your laptop, 
No, I do not believe that social media is a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. I am not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's good for us to step back and reevaluate where we put our time. And are we willing to make the sacrifice to spend time with him? Because here's the reality. If we don't, we won't grow. This is not an osmosis I wish kind of thing, right? This is a, I need to feed that Holy Spirit that lives in me. I need to nourish it. I need to get face to face with him and sometimes flat down on my face with him in order to really hear from him and connect with him. As I walked through this, I experienced an internal peace and a connection that can only come from him. I heard from him about places where I have been really wrong. Places that I didn't know I was wrong. It's kind of that blind spot thing, right? Like we don't know what we don't know until we find out we didn't know it. And the only way we find out we didn't know it is when we sit with him and we hear from him, right? Humility is not just a disposition or a set of phrases. Humility is accurately understanding ourselves and our place in the world. And the only way we know that is as he reveals it to us. Humility is knowing where we came from. It's understanding that without God, we are nothing. Without his care, without his provision, without his love, we would be dust, literally dust. Scripture tells us in Genesis that God got down on his hands and knees. He formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. And then scripture says he leaned over Adam and he breathed his breath into his nostrils and Adam came to life. That's amazing. Without that breath, we are but dust. And without acknowledging that breath and that life within us, we have no power. That is a game changer. That is where we see humility grounding the soul and opening the heart to love and peace. And that's when it stops the striving. I found this um, just this morning, and I just loved it, that quote by A.W. Tozer. He says, the only safe place for a sheep is by the side of his shepherd, because the devil does not fear sheep. He just fears the shepherd. That's all. The devil's not afraid of us. He is afraid of him. And as we walk beside him, now he's shaking in his shoes. I just loved that. That just settled in hard for me. So, so who do I want to lock arms with? Who do I want to be right by? I want to be right by my Jesus in this. So can you see how once we understand this, once we understand that everything Jesus did came from a place of humility, with that backdrop and that DNA, it changes the text that we studied this week. It made me realize how much he loves me. <laughs> that he was and he is the ultimate display of hum humility. He is God, and yet he became human and became a servant in order to have a relationship with us. That's a pretty big deal. So now let's just go through these passages with that as our backdrop. And we're not going to go into great detail about it. But we're going to go through it kind of in, in general. But I am going to really implore you when you get into your small groups to go through it. I know sometimes we get into our small groups and someone has a need or a hurt that we really need to address. And, and there are times that it's easy to sort of put the homework aside. And there are times that that's necessary. I think we always need to balance not casting aside the healer and just looking for the healing but maybe putting the, seeking the healing aside and going right to the healer and waiting. So I, I don't, I want to implore you to work through this together. There's hard stuff in here. That's why it's beautiful that we have sisters in Christ to hash it out with. Talk it through, find freedom, speak it, find your voice, find Jesus in the midst of it. You see, I love how he starts right out of the shoot answering the disciples question about who will be the greatest. Deja vu. Right? It already happened once before. They're asking it again. And just when I want to get really irritated with the disciples, I realize this was before they received the Holy Spirit. So again, they didn't have that power inside of them that we do. So yeah, they're going to keep asking the questions. They're really trying to figure it out, right? They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. 
Beautiful picture of humility right there, right? <laughs> Wasn't the first time they argued about it, and it won't be the last. Spoiler alert, at the Last Supper, after Jesus washes their feet, they recline back, they've got their wine and their bread, and they say, hmm, who's going to be the greatest? They're back at it. It's a common theme, and Jesus keeps bringing it to our attention. So what does Jesus do? How does he answer this question? He brings them a child, right? I loved that devotional, Cindy. It was perfect. What does he do? He brings them a child. The ultimate picture of humility, right? Like, I think back to Lydia marching her little self up those stairs. She had no problem telling me that Hannah thought she was bossy. Pride would have made her shut down and withdraw and not share that because she didn't want anybody to know that somebody called her bossy. But no, children, they just say it like it is. And Hannah had no problem saying, you are bossy, right? They just say it like it is. They don't worry about it. They are the picture of humility. And back then, understand, children were just viewed as property. They were literally to do chores and stay quiet. So the fact that Jesus drew a child out, I'm sure it was very shocking to all the people that were watching and that were listening. And what does he say? He says to everybody, the least of these and the last will be first. And they're shocked. The disciples are shocked and everybody else is shocked. And then he flows right into the whole issue of sin. He says, don't you make one of my little ones stumble. Don't you make, woe to you who leads one of my little ones into sin. It is worse than if, you, than if you had sinned against yourself, right? And this has to be one of the most powerful and dramatic passages in Scripture showing God's hatred of sin. We can't miss this. We just can't miss this one because he does not sugarcoat it, right? He talks about the loss of body parts. If your arm causes you to sin, lose it. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. He's very verbal about it. And, and what I did learn through some of this research, too, was that there was a huge um, segment of the Jews at that time that believed that the condition that your body was in at the time of death was the condition that you would move into eternity in. So for those Jews, the thought of not having a limb because of a sin and then going into eternity like that, like that was devastating to them. But at the end of the day, here's the truth. And here's the point that Jesus was getting at. You're going to lose an arm. Like I was just talking email or texting with a girlfriend this past week and telling her I'm struggling with this. Just will you be praying for me? And she said, seriously, if I did what he said, I think I'd be left with one bone in my elbow. I'm like, that was an elbow. But here's the point, right? We could lose all of our limbs, but what do we still have in our bodies? What's still in here? Our hearts. And our hearts can sin. Our hearts do sin. So here's what he's saying. He, he is not, he's not messing around here. He's like, this is a big deal. And he's laying it down. I was emailing with Dee Dee this week because, to be honest with you, I'm about to throw her under the bus on this one. She was supposed to teach this week. Mm -hmm. And so she sent out an email to the teachers and said, hey, can anybody switch with me? Because I have a chance to go out of town, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, I'll switch. No problem. It works on my calendar. So then I dig into it. I'm like, what did I do? So I emailed her this week. I said, this is really hard. And she goes, yeah, I am so glad that, we, that you switched with me. I'm like, I said, Dee Dee. And she goes, I'm sorry, but I'm really glad I'm not teaching this. So then she sent me an email the next day. She said, OK, I've been thinking about it. So I just thought, I'm going to read to you part of her email, because I couldn't have said it any better. She just, it's beautiful. This is what she said. She says, sin is destructive, self-defeating behavior. It can look so good, sound so good, even feel so good at first, but it only leads to more pain and despair and destruction. It can seem like a way of escape or the solution to an issue, but in the end, it produces more problems. It is twisted truth, a deceptive, seductive counterfeit. It is a hidden trap. No wonder God speaks so protectively and passionately about his little ones and those who believe in him. 
and the issue of sin. No wonder he gives such a graphic illustration warning about it. So can you see how understanding humility and seeking to be attached and grafted onto him is so crucial in really embracing the depravity of our natural sinful condition? Because then what does, I mean, he's such a God of intent. Like, like, let's not forget. He wasn't just like, oh, wait, maybe I'll talk about sin now. And, oh, this is a good time to throw the sheep thing in. Like, no, everything was planned out and everything was laid out with purpose. Because then what does he do? From here, he goes on to talk about the lost sheep. Right? He says, I will leave my 99 to find the one. And I will rejoice more over finding my one lost than over the 99 that did not wander. And that's what he called us to do. And that is humility. Because what do we want to do when we see that one lost? Our natural tendency can be to judge. We can scroll through Facebook, Instagram, whatever it might be. We can see what somebody wrote, hear what somebody said. We can deem them lost, and we can, in our minds and in our hearts, and even verbally with other people, we can judge. It is such a slippery slope. We want to look for fault. And instead, Jesus, in his humility, he loves and he seeks out that lost child. Because guess what? He makes this point really clear in this, too. Whose job is it to love? Whose job is it to love? It's us. It's us. It is our job to love. Whose job is it to judge? Amen. He makes that so abundantly clear. He will judge. We need not judge. And yet, I know I'm digging into this, but I think it's a, it's a slippery slope, and it, it sets us apart and aside from love when we do that. So who do you know that's lost? It could be one of your own children. Love them. It could be someone else's child. Love them, and don't judge that parent. It could be a, a sibling. It could be a parent. The key is, he is telling us, you seek out that lost soul, and you love them. That's it, plain and simple. Then it's as if he knew our hearts and our nature, and he walks us through forgiveness in the process of working it out. And it all requires humility to do it the way he's describing it, doesn't it? He calls us into that tension between long-suffering and grace and mercy for our sisters and brothers and turning the other cheek and confronting the sin and the behavior. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. This is tough stuff in here when he talks about confronting the sin in a fellow believer. And I believe that what he's talking about in this text is a pretty big issue. It's a pretty big sin, big enough that it's going to the church in the end. Because what he's saying is, look, here's how I've laid it out. If there's a sin that this brother or sister needs to be confronted with, and you go on your own and that doesn't work, and you take someone else and that doesn't work, you take it to the church and you let the church work it out. And then he says, if that doesn't work, then what are we supposed to do? Treat them like a pagan. And what do we do to pagans? We love them. We love them. Right? It's just that word pagan makes you want to not like them, right? Oh, they're pagans. Ugh. But no, he wants us to love them. So then the issue, I don't know about you guys, but this was the issue that kind of came up for me. What do I confront? And what do I not confront? If we confronted everybody on every sin that we saw, and if everybody confronted us on the sins that they saw, we would be sitting in a confessional 24 hours a day, would we not? So it's, I wish I had a clear answer to it, but I really believe that is a situation where we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus, are you looking for me to give forgiveness and mercy and be long-suffering and turn the other cheek? Or is this something I need to confront my sister on? And some of the things that I kind of run through in my mind are these. 
am I really looking for my sister's best interest? <clears throat> like, is this something that is keeping her from a deeper and more intimate relationship with Jesus and others? So maybe that is something I would go to my sister on. Is this something that I find myself holding a grudge over? And that's a tough one, you know. That's, that's what made this teach so hard for me. I'll, I'll be really honest with you. What God really showed me through this and, and really grappling with this, confronting a sister, because this, this is hard for me to know when to do that and when not to do that. And I've had people confront me that it, it, I experienced it as very unloving and very judgmental. And I've confronted other sisters in Christ, and I thought I did it from a place of love and the place that I thought it was supposed to come from, um, and it went very badly. Uh, so this is not a formula and a sweet little process, but what God really showed to me in the last week and what put me underneath the desk like that crying was that I'm, I'm quite a grudge holder. I didn't really think that I was, you know, I thought that it was a have a right to be angry because I was hurt. So consequently, I would hold a grudge. And so at one point, just this last week, I said to Dave, I think I might, I'm really struggling because I really think I'm a grudge holder. And he was so sweet. He just said, hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I said, you agree, don't you? And he's like, you have a hard time letting go, which is another word for a grudge holder. Because when you find yourself laying in bed at night and you're spinning over the conversation over and over again, and what you would have said and what you would say now and how you would have said it and the hurt that it caused, Oh, you guys, that just serves nobody but the enemy, right? That's where the enemy creeps in. So I, I want so badly to stand up here and tell you, this is when you confront a sister, this is when you don't, and this is how it will come out. <clears throat> but in the end, it's all just a really humbling experience because it's kind of a trial and error. Sometimes it works out really sweetly, and sometimes it doesn't. But here is where it is so crucial to root down into him. Because at the end, what does he tell us to do if a conflict or conf and confrontation does not end in repentance? He tells us to keep loving. And that kind of love requires humility. So this would be a good thing to bat around in your small group. To talk through what that would look like, what that might not look like, what have your experiences been with that. I will say, though, at the end of the day, I think we always need to think through, why am I not speaking truth if I experience God calling me to speak truth? And why do I want to speak truth to somebody? Am I angry? Am I hurt? Think through the reasons beforehand. And then this is where we got to go before him. And we've got to ask him for the com confirmation either way. You see, this chapter is full of so many difficult truths, and I wish we had hours to talk it through because I would have loved that. I would encourage you to always have women in your life that will be honest with you. Women in your life that you can be honest with. I think a great place to start with this is with one friend that you fully trust. I have a sweet friend like that. And we just went on vacation as couples together, just she and her husband and my husband and I. And before we left, I said, OK, Bats, I want you to is think this through as I was preparing for this. Is there something in my life that you see that is a sin that is holding me back from a deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus and freedom with him and with other women and, and binding me from loving? And she said, I will think that through and pray that through, but I want you to do the same for me. It was such a sweet way to do it because then it was like a week later and we could sit down. I knew what was coming. I knew something was coming. I didn't know what was coming. I knew something was coming. So I could pray that God would help me to receive it. It felt like a gift because I'll tell you, I've had many times it has not felt like a gift. It was intended to be a gift many times, and I did not take it as a gift. So that I would encourage you to find one woman, one sister in Christ that you can do that with. Here's the thing. 
We never just obtain humility, but we can have an encounter with the God of the universe that changes the core of who we are. And when we come face to face with our creator and we acknowledge that we are his creation, not the creator, and we submit to him as Lord of all, that's when we find rest. We take his yoke. We embrace the humbleness that comes from being his child. And we are changed. In this book I read, um, she told the story about this vineyard in an area of France. Um, and it was a thriving vineyard, produced amazing wines. And um, all of a sudden, they had an infestation of these, of these insects. And the insects were killing off the vines, and they weren't able to produce. They had scientists looking at them year after year after year. And what they realized is the solution would be to take one of these roots and graft it to an American vineyard root and come up with a combined vineyard. Well, this French um, wine producer refused to, to, to do that. He wouldn't compromise his wine. He wanted it to be purely French. So eventually it's, it all died off, except one man kept one root and he decided to graft it with an American root. And they produced a vineyard in France that was a combination of an American vine and a French wine. And they produced the most beautiful, amazing grapes with the most beautiful and amazing wine. And I thought that's, and she makes the point that that's so much like us, you know? It's so easy to not wanna be grafted it, it's painful to be uprooted and to be grafted to something else. We want to feel like, I want to feel like I can do this on my own. But he wants us to graft to him, and that's what makes us better. That's what makes us stronger and sweeter, and that's what makes us more and more like him, which takes us closer to that place of humility, right? You see, humility grounds the soul, and it opens the heart to love and peace. And isn't that... Really, at the end of the day, isn't that what this hurting world needs? Isn't that what people need? Like, they want to know that they are loved. They want to experience a peace, and so do we. So what I would love to do as we close up, if you guys wouldn't mind, I would love it if you guys would just take a breath, close your eyes, put your pens down, and I would love to pray over you uh, a verse from Ephesians and close us up in prayer. So I want you to go ahead and just take a good deep breath. Breathe in his grace, his mercy, his love. Exhale it out. And visualize whatever it would be that draws you into the presence of Christ. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Father God, I thank you so much for this evening. I thank you for every woman in this room. And I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your words. Amazing that you give us such vivid illustrations of what you've called us to. And so, Jesus, I ask that as we move through the rest of this week, as these women move into their small groups, I ask that they would graft themselves to you, that they would root deeply down into you. I ask that we would be so mindful of a place that we could set something aside and grab time with you, Jesus, that we would learn from you, that we would enter into relationship with you and have an encounter with you where we experience rest and we find you. So Jesus, again, I thank you for your word. I praise you for who you are, that you are an awesome creator. I pray that each one of these women feel a sense of peace and joy as they move into their small groups. And I ask for protection as they drive home this evening. 
Thank you, Jesus, for your presence and the gift of your Holy Spirit. I pray this in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm. wow.